everybody, welcome back. Them in the OG, the original Grognard, and we are back sitting down at the table and we're taking a look at something we haven't done before. That's usually most of what I do. <laughs> we're taking a look at Goblin today. I know it's not historical, it is obviously fantasy. Dwarf Star Games 1981. Now, before I get into into going over Goblin, I kind of kind of got to touch on Dwarf Star Games a little bit. Uh, they were uh, a subsidiary of Heritage USA, which did a lot of miniature stuff back in the early 80s. Um, Dwarf Star Games was not a didn't have a huge library of games. I think eventually they came out with like eight or ten games, um, and they were these smaller. And as you can see, this is kind of a well-worn boxed games, kind of like micro games, kind of cool. They were only like eight, ten bucks. Um, which was pretty cool when, you know, a full-size Avalon Hill box game at the time was like 20. And they had a lot of good replay value. But honestly, Dwarf Star Games kind of hit it out of the ballpark with every game they did. We got a little catalog here. Uh, does it open up? I don't think it opens up. I think it's just one page. No, it does open up. What's in here? No, nope, nothing in there. What a rip. Anyway, so, and this has got a couple of their other games on it. Uh, Demon Lord was was a really cool game, kind of nations, uh, na uh, uh, fantasy nations at war against each other. Probably very uh, influenced by Lord of the Rings. Uh, Star Vikings, really, really cool game of uh, stellar Vikings coming and raiding and pillaging. It had... Uh, 12 map tiles of planet or 12 planet tiles in it and each game you'd randomly draw like six or eight and those would be the ones you'd go to and uh those that would be basically be the game map and you'd you'd uh uh the, the vikings would come in and go raid different planets and the planets would have different technological ratings and different wealth levels and stuff like it. really cool game really cool game um so it had a lot of replayability because of all these different map tiles uh outpost gamma not a bad game uh it's uh, yeah, a game of technologies and conflict, powered armor troopers of the empire at numbered fifty to one. So yeah, it's a really good game if you want to look at how to do uh, a small handful of troops against <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of enemies. Uh, there was Grav Armor again, a really great game. They probably did oh geez, one of the best hex crawls ever, Barbarian Prince, and then they had a solitaire game. Uh, uh, Outlaw Smuggler, which was kind of a space smuggling game. That was kind of cool, too, because you had all these planet tiles, and they were they were kind of split in half, and you would take a left half and a right half and put them together, and they'd have all these little nodes on them that you could go and travel out, and everything was done kind of like choose-your-own-adventure. So, really, when you get down to it, Dwarf Star Games did a lot of really, really cool games in the early 80s, and they did them really cheap. Um, I do know one of the games, Dragon Strike, which was a really cool game where you had all these different types of monsters attacking and, and trying to destroy this city. That got reprinted a few years ago. They updated the graphics and, and uh, you know, made it a full-size game. So, so Dwarf Star Games kind of holds a, a very unique niche in, in the annals of wargaming history because they did... You would, I don't want to say low quality, low priced, well quality games, and then they just kind of disappeared. And even I'm not really sure why they kind of disappeared. But anyways, so this is this is this is one of the games that they did. This is Goblins, one of the first games, and the, the, the box is definitely seen better days i acquired this copy from a buddy of mine he was uh having to downsize and so wanted to sell me all just wanted me to sell all those games on the net and my payment was i got to keep what games i really wanted from it and this was one of them i think i made him like a thousand dollars overall so you know it was a good deal for both of us um and jerry i love him but he was a bit of a hoarder and a lot of the games aren't really great quality I will just go ahead and say, as as you can look at the map, you can probably already woo, zoom in. Let's go ahead and tighten that that down a little bit. Um, yeah, let's get the, the get the negative out of the way. The cardboard is absolute garbage. Not designed to hold up for forty years, especially in the Pacific Northwest when we have a slightly moist environment and things can warp. I mean, this is uh, this is this is this is even thinner than you know uh, cereal box cardboard. So you're not going to play it without putting it under plexiglass or or or, or, or something. 
Um, now the counter sheet has, and I'll get more to this in a little bit. Counter sheet's still the same same cardboard type, but it, it's it's managed to hold up a lot better. But yeah, it, you're you're going to be hard pressed to probably find a really good quality. It, just the cardboard was real cheap, and so if you do manage to track down one of these games, you're going to have to flip, lay it down flat and put it under plastic or, or something like that. But other than that, this map looking is phenomenal i mean okay let's remember this is 1981 nobody with the exception of avalon hills asl were doing maps this colorful this hand-drawn this beautiful at the time nobody nobody was doing this couple games from avalon hill all right yeah maybe all right outdoor survival nah, whatever um but i mean you take a look at all the games late 70s early 80s uh, SPI, Avalon Hill, most of the maps were four or five color. They were utilitarian. I mean, hey, you know, no complaints. It's it's the way it was back then. People seem to forget, oh, back in the early 80s, the, the, the graphics quality was crap. Yeah, because it was all hand-drawn. We didn't have computer-assisted anything back then. Anything you wanted to do, you had to have it hand-drawn. Most of the time, a lot of these smaller companies was Joe, Billy, and Robert in their basement or their garage. And, you know, none of them had art degrees, probably. They just did what they had. I mean, they didn't. There was no internet back then. So it's not like you can go onto Facebook and go to Gamers Market or Gamers Artwork and, and try to find an artist and, and do it. No, you did everything in-house. So I really wish people would stop giving the, the, the early 80s. Yeah, all right. It was a lot of bad artwork. But if you don't remember why it was the bad artwork, F off. So, But anyways, I, I just absolutely love this map. It definitely hand-drawn. Okay, maybe not the best quality hand-drawn, but it could have been a hell of a lot worse. I mean, take a look at the buildings in there, the fields. I mean, I really like this map. It's got kind of a, a watercolor feel to it and everything. So, um so the map is really cool. Take a look at the counters. And the counters, eh, you know, again, they're not really that great. But then again, we didn't have the the reach and the ability to do really high quality. I, I mean, honestly, some these are some probably better quality art counters that I've seen from the early 80s. Um, but yeah, so one map board. 154 counters. You got a bunch of pillage markers. And you got the Baron arrives, and then you've got the feudals, which actually kind of, I mean, you get in there, and they, they kind of look like goblins as well. And uh, some more feudals, and the Baron's people, and then you've got all bunch, and you got and you got the leaders, and ruins, and goblins, and goblin confidence. Uh, the goblin king can only maintain... Uh, control as long as he has confidence of his of his goblins and you know you got different types of goblins range not much in the way of range goblins but you know melee goblins a whole bunch of different types of stuff so oh yeah i didn't even show off the goblin leaders you know they're goblins <laughs> they look fine to me um what else have we got in here itty bitty tiny teeny tiny d6 because it could fit in the box uh, you got this little uh, sheet where you keep track of the goblin confidence. Like I said, if it starts to get too low, then the goblins will overthrow their king. Uh, you got plunder, how much plunder the goblins are going to get away with, how many game turns you're playing. And, of course, the itty-bitty little rule book. How many pages? 24 pages. That's actually kind of an impressive amount. You know, it's 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 not skimpy by any means. There is a little bit of meat to this game. So, anyways, what's the purpose? What's the point? What it, what are you doing in the game? Well, you got two players, obviously. You got the human player who's defending his his kingdom, and then you got the goblins that are coming in from the mountains. And as you can see, you've got these little caves with arrows to them, and that's where all the goblins are coming from all along this entire edge. And what the goblins are doing is they're trying to get to villages like Suthdown or Swillgate or Lakeshore, The Keep, Riverfield, getting to any of these cities. And I think there's the Abbey up here. Yeah, the Abbey up here. Getting to those villages 
and plundering them. And once they plunder them, and you plunder them by basically defeating the defending units that are in there, uh, then, then the goblin forces grab one of these tokens, and then they got to try to get the token back to one of their caves and exit it off the board, and then they'll, they'll score a bunch of plunder. And if you'll notice, some places are worth more plunder than others. It's like, so Ulfheim is worth five or six, but if you get the keep, that's worth 17 to 24. The Abbey's worth 13 to 18. You know, Tweaksbury is nine to 12. There is a chart that you roll against. And so if they, you don't know how much plunder you're going to get until, the, until your goblin troops get them back uh, off the edge of the map board. So, you know, kind of a straight up forward smash and grab. Very, very low casualties in this game. The entire game pretty much focuses on forcing morale checks. And if you fail the morale check, then you run away. It's really hard to kill somebody in this game. I mean, really, to, to kill somebody, you kind of got to block off their entire avenue of escape. And there are some rules for governing how uh, what paths units can take for re to retreat. So you're not going to be killing a lot of units. Well, that's kind of a kind of a bad thing. What if the goblins get a hold of the, the loot? Well, if the goblins lose a morale and have to retreat, they drop the loot. So, you know, that's kind of convenient in that way. So it's more a game of, of maneuvering and forcing morale checks rather than out-and-out -out destruction of enemy units. Now, kind of the cool thing about it is, is it's meant to be played with one person taking the role as the goblin initially and coming through, doing his raiding and pillaging, and then leaving, and then you switch sides with the other pl with the player who was playing as the human defenders, taking the goblins, and basically see who does the best. And there is also rules in there for a cam cam campaign game, which is where the goblin confidence comes into play, and uh, it's it's a meter that goes up and down uh, depending on how much plunder they get back, and that goes down with how much uh, uh, how many troops they lose and so on and so forth. Um, one of the other kind of unique things about it is units cannot move on their own. Well, it's not unique, but one thing to point out, units can't move on the loan. They have to be with the leader. And the problem is a lot of the initial starting militia that the, that the human forces have don't have any leaders. In fact, they only have, if I remember the scenario set up, they only have like two or three leaders that that start on the on the game and i think they started like uh the big city and maybe the abbey so the human player doesn't have a lot of options to be able to respond with there's a whole bunch of because like i said you you can get other leaders i mean there is obviously a lot of leaders available most of them are baron troops i'd only come on when the baron comes on and, you know, there's the Baron arrives right there, and the Baron's got a whole bunch of these troops down here. Cavalry and, you know, heavy infantry and such like that. Uh, and the Orcs got a bunch of troops. So with only having two or three leaders on the board to start off with, the human player really needs to, to prioritize where he's going to go after because basically all the goblin leaders, there's like eight goblin leaders, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven goblin leaders, and they're all jammed to the gills with troops, and they can be spreading out all over the place trying to trying to ravage and pillage and plunder. So it's kind of a little bit of resource management from the human side because, again, you've got limited amount of forces. And since really you're not able to kill a lot of the enemy forces unless basically you, you surround them and give them no opportunity to, uh, to escape. And that's kind of hard to do when you've only got two or three stacks of troops. The goblins can do it real easy, but their point is they need to try to spread out and hit as many targets as they can, get the plunder, and get back. So this, that, that in a nutshell is, is goblin. Um, why am I telling you? It's because I want to get this to the table. Yes, yes, I know. I said I was going to get Starship Troopers. Give my finger out. I was going to get Starship Troopers, and then I was looking at getting Firepower, but the problem is there's there's no real small scenarios in Starship Troopers. Again, early 80s Avalon Hill. Um, I need to do a video on Starship Troopers. Did I do a video? I can't even remember if I did. It's been so long since I did a video last. I can't even remember if I did a video on Starship Troopers. There just is no... I mean, the smallest scenario that have... Um, uh, bugs in it and I, well you could do a small scenario that's got the skinnies but it's starship troopers nobody wants to fight see the mi fighting against skinnies they want to see the mi fighting against bugs and i think the smallest scenario even the smallest scenario has like 48 units on the 
Terran side alone and probably double to triple that on the bug side. And that's it. It's just too big to try to do a game gameplay video on. So I may get to it. I may not. Firepower, cool game. It's got a basic set of rules in it. It's like four pages. That's definitely playable. And then you've got squad leader level rules for the advanced game size i mean it's like 86 pages long so i was like uh, and i don't need another tactical system bouncing around in my head maybe i'll get to it at some point maybe i'll just do a do a do a what's in the box video okay so um so the plan was i was going to get this to the table and play it and as you will notice it is an unpunched copy now i am not a collector i'm a player Every game I have, even if I have the hint of thinking I'm going to play it, I punch it. I have got a copy of Rise and Decline of the Third Reich, which I know I will probably, there's a 99% chance I will never play. It's punched anyways. I got it and I punched it anyways. So I am not above punching games. And I was getting ready to punch this. And then someone mentioned something about Tabletop Simulator. And so I, I was like, oh, I didn't even think of checking Tabletop Simulator. Because, I mean, honestly, again, it's a 40-year-old game. Yep, it's on Tabletop Simulator. So I downloaded the mod on Tabletop Simulator. So if I get around and get the gumption to do this, I will be playing this game. I will be doing it through Tabletop Simulator. And, you know, all right, maybe maybe my, my natural inclination... Uh, to to punch this is is going to be pushed to the wayside because it is kind of a rare game yeah the map's not in really good condition but it's intact and the counters are unpunched so maybe one day in the future if i need some finances or something i can i can turn around and so because yeah these games do not go cheap on ebay they're like 80 90 100 on average for some of them so you know it's it's a it's a nice little nice little little nest egg if i need it real quick so that's kind of why i am showing off goblin door star games 19 oh oh one last thing i did want to say <laughs> dwarf star games may not be around as a company and i think reaper heritage reaper picked up uh heritage usa the, a lot of the line from heritage usa their miniature line and they also picked up goblin or not goblin uh the dwarf star games you can actually find the pdfs online for free from the website for like eight of the dwarf star games and if you want to download them and print and play they don't care i will go ahead and stick a link uh to that website uh in the comment section below so people can check out dwarf star games again uh if you like hex crawls barbarian prince was one of the best ones if you like solitaire choose your own adventure then go with uh, uh star smuggler or something i think it's star smuggler um vikings is a really i mean they're all they're all great games they are really all great games go check them out and hopefully I'll get this set up on Tabletop Simulator and played here relatively soon. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section below. And I'll see everybody later. See ya!